So as far as logistics go, we will have it on Zoom, as long as I turn it on. Um, but on Zoom, you'll be seeing this kind of a profile if you're, if you're home and on Zoom. You'll basically be seeing this because I'll be addressing the class and we'll be on this. We're probably going to do it in this room. That way we can record. Uh, right now, I do have the video camera on and the computer is recording everything we're doing. So be careful what you say. Um, you can't be heard pretty much. You guys can't be heard. So remind me when you ask questions. At the, so we're going to do two blocks of, of lecture. So we'll do about 40, 40 to 45 minutes. At the end, I'll let you ask questions, okay? So unless there's something extremely pertinent, like you're going to die if you don't ask the question. Don't ask the question till the end. Uh, if you'll notice in the notes, there's plenty of marginal spaces to make notes. So I will give you guys time at the end of each section of lectures. So we'll lecture for about 40 minutes. I'll give you uh, 10 minutes of question and answer time, and then we'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back. We'll do another lecture block, 10 minutes of question and answer. Hopefully we'll get out of here before 8 o'clock each night, okay? Um, everyone knows where the restrooms are along the wall over here. There's handicapped ones down there. There are snacks in the kitchen if you need a snack. Thank you, Abigail, for helping. Good job. Way to go. You, you can be the hostess now. You show everywhere where the snacks are. Anyway, on the back wall by the, the freezer, there's some snacks there. There's uh, water bottles and sodas. Well, kind of like waters in the, in the uh, fridge on the right-hand side. Hey, Wes, sorry. Good morning, Vietnam. Hi, Wes. Okay, we got, we got Wes on here. Okay, Wes, you're going to be seeing me like, kind of like this, I think. No problem. There you go. Let's see. So if I don't look at you, just make noise. Um, I sent you, uh, Wes, I sent you an email with the uh, syllabus in it. I picked up the syllabus. Oh. Sure. I mean, you got the notes, but you didn't get this, probably. Did you get the, the, cl yeah. the class outline? The big book? Yeah, the big book, but then I've got this is just the, uh, I emailed that to you. Anyway, you'll have that in there. That, that basically gives you the course outline and what we're going to be doing. So we'll, we'll go over that first, uh, but I'll open in a word of prayer. Okay, so we've got no Georgia, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We're supposed to have 16. Who else are we missing? Oh, Kit and Kim. Okay, and Georgia. Let's see, Georgia and Jeff. Jeff and Georgia. Okay, anyway, so we're going to start on this. Um, so I pretty much covered logistics so far, everything that we're going to be doing. Anyway, so yeah, so we'll do Zoom, and we'll have it online. We'll have the, uh, I gave Rachel more work because we're going to have more videos and recordings up there. Hopefully I won't mess that up. So anyway, uh, Wes, when you have a question, we'll do questions at the end. So we'll do a 40-minute block, 40 minute block, and then we'll have question and answers at the end of the lecture time. Um, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll do the same thing second hour, and then hopefully we'll be out of here at 10 to 8. Anyway, um, so anyway, let me open in a word of prayer, and then I want to go over our, uh, the, the syllabus I gave you guys, just the outline for the course. So let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this evening. We thank you for giving us a time and the opportunity, Lord, to study your word. We thank you, those for who have faithfully gone before us. We thank you for uh, Dr. Mike, Lord, for his work over in, uh, in the East, in Haiti, and in um, Saudi Arabia, Lord, where he's been teaching. We thank you for that, and the Emirates, and uh, ask, Lord, your blessings upon him wherever he is now. Thank you for his diligence in preparing the material for us. We thank you, and we want to honor him and what he has done for us. And we just ask, Father, that you would lead us now tonight, Lord, with your spirit. You would open your word to us, and you would just give us, Lord, the understanding of what the church is. What are the called out ones? Who are we in Christ? And how does that affect our day-to-day -day living, Lord? How are we being conformed to the image of Christ? And how is the, the church a means of your grace to us? So, Lord, help us to rightly understand these things. Help us th this evening, Lord, to see the importance of the church as you've established it and as Christ is continuing to build his church today. And so we just thank you, Lord, for the miraculous things you're doing in our midst and hoping, Father, that you would use us in those regards. So we thank you for the evening. Ask again, Father, that you would attend to our time for your glory and for the good of your people. We do ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, good. So binder and things are there. So questions, will, so basically, Kit, will do a, a 40-minute 40, 40 blocks and then 10-minute time at the end for that. Um, if you open up your syllabus, the first thing I want to alert you to is that these are not, this is not my material. Uh, Dr. Mike gives credit where credit is due. Um, when you're reading through the notes, don't think that the footnotes are just for fun. The footnotes actually ha usually have a lot of information in it. Dr. Mike is one of those crazy people who puts more information sometimes in his footnotes than in each page, so you have to be aware of that. Anyway... 
just want to give credit where credit is due. If you want to use the material to give to someone, just let me know beforehand. That's basically what this whole dissertation is all about right here. And so if you would just uh, read that on your own, just to make sure you know who is to be given the credit for the, the material that we'll, we'll be using. And then on page three, the course description, ecclesiology. Who can tell me what ecclesi- the word ecclesiology means? Who knows what that word means? The what? Study of the church. Study of the church. What is a, a, a ecclesia? What is ecclesia? So ology is a study of ecclesia. So we're studying ecclesia. What is ecclesia? Called out ones. Called out ones. Yes, the called out ones. Okay. Next week we'll be talking about uh, epistemology. We'll talk about the etymology of the words that were used for that. So don't be freaked out by the word etymology. It's just basically a study of the origin of a word. How many of you use the word cool these days? How many of you know that word has like transcendent meaning, right? It's cool is always cool, cool, cool from every generation. But you word, use the word sick today and it means something else, right? Okay, so that's something we'll, we'll talk about um, when we get into the next chapter. Don't be freaked out with these big words. Ology is just the study of something, okay? Then it's the study of something. Uh, etymology is just the study of the origin of a word. So we're going to do etymology next week. So don't be worried about that. Ecclesiology this week, but ecclesiology is designed, if you're on page three at the top, course description, ecclesiology is designed to give an overview, this course is to give an overview of the Bible's teaching concerning the church. This course is designed to study the origin, nature, organization, and function of the church. Special prominence is given to its government, its officers, its discipline, and its ordinances. So we will be talking about foot washing. Everybody okay with that? No. Good. Okay. The next section is partially uh, what we do here at our particular church. It says, this course will examine the current Christian community as it sees itself by conducting a theological survey leading the student to a biblical view and definition of the subject. The hopeful result, we do want results, will be a proper application in the life of the church locally and globally. We always want to think about missions. To exalt Christ, to the glory of God the Father, empowered by the Spirit. I want you to turn with me really quickly to page 7. And as we study this, I hopefully these things will be more uh, prominent. This is our vision and purpose statement for Grace Baptist Church. So if you turn to page 7, I want to read through this really quickly and say these are some of the things that we're focused on as a church. The vision for our church is this. We exist to exalt Christ to the glory of God the Father, empowered by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each believer for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry of the gospel in the church. And get references for those as Philippians 2, 9 through 11, and Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. So we are here and exist. The church is here to equip the saints for the work of the service. How many of you think that the pastors and the leaders are supposed to do all the work? Raise your hand. No, uh-uh, no, no. Ephesians 4, 11 says they're there, they're there for the equipping of the saints for the work, purpose of the work. So we're supposed to equip the saints. You know, the leadership of the church is supposed to be the equippers of the church. So that's one of the reasons we're here tonight is for the equip, you to be equipped. So are you guys just going to go ahead with all this knowledge when you get all this knowledge and just be a bobblehead and sit at home and go like this? Hopefully not. Hopefully you're going to explain things to other people, right? That's the idea is that as you're equipped, then you will explain the doctrine of the church to other people. You'll have a firm foundation to be able to do that. Look under purpose. It says, the purpose, Grace Baptist Church strives to empower its members for a life of of commitment to the centrality and sufficiency of Christ through Scripture saturation and a dependence upon the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. This is to result in a life of commitment to Christ through biblical fidelity, faithfulness to the Scriptures, moral integrity, intellectual growth, and a commitment to the church and the kingdom of God. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and what? What's the last one that Jesus added? Mind, right? We use this to love God. We use our mind. We use our intellect to love God. Uh, These are evidenced by a life of commitment to Christ as Lord and Savior, as well as service to and in the church, to the church and in the church, through a study and application of the Word of God. Look at Ezra 7.10 when you want to understand what he was about. He devoted his life to the study of the Word of God. The pursuit of holiness through self-examination and that of the leadership of Grace Baptist Church. That means, guess what? Me and John can come knock on your door and say, how are you doing with these things, right? 
So we examine. We're not doing that because we're mean. We want to know how to encourage you. We want to know how to love you and equip you for the, for the work of the service of the ministry. Evidences of this growth and holiness will include stewardship of his or her time, talents, and treasures, care of the individual's body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's in our lesson tonight. Confession of sin, repentance of sin, forgiveness sought and given, seeking reconciliation. That's a major component of the church, Okay. We need to do that within the body of Christ, within the church. Furthermore, the goal is not to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power unto salvation, but to be interactive in the community as an ambassador of Christ, as though God were making an appeal through them on behalf of Christ. The elder team of Grace Baptist Church recognizes that God fits an individual for ministry and Christian service. Grace Baptist Church seeks to be used by the Holy Spirit to exalt Christ to the glory of God the Father as Christ builds his church... We hope to be used to equip the saints for the work of the service of the building up of the body of Christ. To God be the glory now and forevermore. And I might even add in there, in the church. He be glorified in the church. So that's in reference to the end of the course description there. Anyway, course objectives. Hopefully you all agree with the course objectives as I read through them. The student will be passionately embraced and participate in God's eternal purpose to glorify himself in his son and in his people, which is to say the church. So the church is a means by which God does what? He glorifies himself through the church. The church is a means by which God is glorified. And that the student will humbly provoke others, believers, to do the same. How many of you like that, that sentence in Hebrews 10 where it says, spur one, spur one another along to love and good deeds? How many of you guys like the King James on that? To spur, you, know, you wear your spurs, you poke, no. Lovingly encourage, right? Not using spurs. How many horse riders in the room? Right, just a few. Do you guys use spurs still? No, you don't. You're not supposed to use first. You're supposed to go giddy up, right? Anyway, number two, that the student will gain a synthetic overview of ecclesiology. Well, that just sounds way too wordy, right? You need to be able to connect the dots. Look what I put in parentheses there. Be able to connect the dots and to be able to relate implications of these doctrines to other areas of systematic theology and the gospel at whole. How does it work together? Okay, I'll just make that simple for you. How does our study of, of the church work together with our understanding of the gospel and the purposes of the church. So anyway, these are the things that we just want to see how this thing all connects. Number three, the student will be cognizant, you'll be aware of, the chief categories, central passages, and key definitions involved in the doctrine of the church. Number four, the student will gain insight into the theological implications of specific issues related to ecclesiology, such as the distinctions between Israel and the church, the practice of the church, membership and discipline, the importance of and implications implementation of biblical church polity and numerous other matters of applied ecclesiology or practices in the church. Number five, the student will understand the difference between various theological systems as they are related to the doctrine of the church and discussed in this course, and that the student will be able to uh, obtain a basic bibliography for further study. And that's what's going to be on that last page. Number seven, turn the page over. Number four, the student will be encouraged to as he comprehends the ways in which God uses his church as a, as a community of believers to minister to his people, to advance the gospel in the world, and to bring glory to his name throughout eternity. Wow, the church doesn't have an end point. That the student will be able to construct his own theological system and subjects pertaining to ecclesiology. Nine, the student will be able to intelligently and coherently explain doctrines which have been discussed in class. Remember we talked about that? You don't just take these things home and hide them in, in your room or in your head. That the student will be able to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the various v- theological viewpoints concerning ecclesiology. Number 11, the student will, will, will think biblically, deeply, intentionally, and strategically about the gospel, the church, and the implications that each have for the other. And that the student will grow in godliness and in loyalty to Christ and his church as a result of what he has learned in this course. The main thing is that last one, right? You'll grow in your understanding, your loyalty to Christ, your love for Christ, your godliness. He will conform us to the image of him through the study of his words. We'll love him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Anyway, if these all don't get accomplished, that's okay. But those are goals for us, okay? Think about that. These are things that we're looking hopefully to. Um, Anyway, I'll be using the New American Standard. You guys are free to use those. Anybody here have a message Bible? Good, because we don't want to have to burn Bibles today. So there are certain translations I just do not recommend because we're going to be pretty precise with things. So again, those are the ones that I would recommend. If you have something else besides a new uh, NIV, King James, New King James, or ESV or NSAB, uh, let me know. 
uh, only requirements that we have are is the, is the is the binder in front of you that you got. Um, tonight we're going to go through chapter one. Your reading assignment will be chapter two for next week. It's pretty lengthy. Yes, Kit. Who, the what, the where, will I? You don't have one of these? So there should be a binder. There should be, uh, there should be one of these on the tops of the binders. So if you grabbed a binder, there should, there should have been one on top of it. <laughs> um, I got only printed eight pages. There's 16, right? Oh, on, uh, no, the syllabus, you should have just seven pages. The one I eat. Yeah, just the, uh, just just the basically the course outline. Right. Yeah, on the front cover you should have ecclesiology, uh, ST three hundred two ecclesiology. It should just be seven. Should be seven pages. Okay. I, it, it showed sixteen on the. Wow, you got a good. Well, you can do more work then. <laughs> well, they were all blank. Oh, never. <laughs> that will not help you. Um, so I shared it to you out of Google out of Google Drive, so it should be there. Okay, I'll look there. I, I just took it off my email. Yeah, I emailed it to you. Maybe it wasn't complete. Good evening. Da, 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 da. Uh oh, I don't know where it went. Grace Bible College should be there. Okay, you're back on. Um. Turn to page six. This is basically the, our 12-week course study, and I want to just alert you guys to some things in the notes. If you would turn with me really quickly to chapter nine, which is on page 257. Turn with me to 257. That will be a little bit of work. Actually, go one more chapter. Go to 274, Purposes of the Church and the Unity of the Church. Uh, actually, 274, sorry, chapter 10, The Purpose of the Church. As you can see, most of these are pretty good-sized chapters, but when you get to chapter 10, 274, there's only one page, and chapter 11 is only a, not even a page. When we get there, if we have time, I will give you guys some handouts. In the notes, you'll see that, that in, the, in the course syllabus, it says that I have, the, I have the right to give you extra stuff, but this is enough stuff. What I'm basically saying is when we get to chapter 10 and 11, you have kind of a break there, and we'll get into chapter 12 with the discipline of the church and then into separation of the church. Dr. Mike was big on chapter 13, so he's got quite a bit of information there. So we'll see how that goes. I just wanted to alert you that when, you get, when we get down to 10 and 11, there's only two pages there, so it's going to be a really quick go through. I might have some stuff set up for you guys, though, when we get there. If we're running behind, as we normally are, then we'll just jump into 12 and 13 so that we can finish in the 12 weeks. Um, also, if you'll notice on the course outline, today is the only date on there. That's because the military is keeping me in limbo right now with when I get to go to Connecticut. So um, I will let you guys know as soon as I know that I'm going to leave town for two weeks, I'll let you know when the break is, which means you can read chapters 10 and 11. It's only two pages. No, I'm just kidding. And it gives you a chance to catch up. But the reading is pretty straightforward. Don't worry about any of that. So... Uh, we went through all the purposes. Are there any questions as far as the course outline? Um, I haven't prepared an exam yet. Last time we had a class, nobody turned in the exam for a, uh, eschatology. Nobody wanted to have end time fun studies. So um, if you want to take it for grades, I mean, we can assign you units. We have a way of doing that. Um, I don't know that they're transferable, but we can do that for those of you off to Bible college and some things like that. Um, so let me know if you want to do that. Uh, any questions before we get started? We're going to start, we're going to jump into page chapter one. Any questions? What if you're not going to be here if you're going to be on Zoom? So I'm still surprised I don't see more people on Zoom because I know that my house was supposed to be on there too. So anyway, um, so Rachel will be sending out, if I'm not leading too much, Rachel will be sending out the address for Zoom uh, if you guys want to do that. So just make sure she has your email. So on the roster, is the roster going around the room? So everybody's got their email. So I'm going to give that to Rachel so she knows you guys. So if the roster hasn't gone around, let's do that. Anyway, let's start on page 58. And I'm going to talk as fast as I possibly can. Um, on the extra books, I do have three of those, the, the books on that thing. The Church by Mark Dever. This one I do recommend if you want to read about the church. Uh, this is by Kevin DeYoung and Ted Cluck. It says, Why We Love the Church. 
Um, and so this is, this is a good premise on the emergent church. So we'll talk about that after we get to that. But that is a very good book. It's an easy read. Don't be scared of those books if you want to take a look at those at all. So anyway, I'm going to start on page 58 and the importance of the church. Is the church important to us? Let's think about this for a minute. So on page 58 it says, Up with Jesus, down with the church, and similarly worded sentiments were common among the Jesus movement of the 60s. Anybody born in the 60s here besides myself? I was born in 1967. Guess what happened in 1967? It was the Jesus movement, okay? Even Time Magazine had Jesus on the front cover, okay? There was a huge, huge evangelistic uh, outpouring of the Jesus culture and the attack. I mean, there was up, uh, see what, 250,000 got saved um, across the nation at that time. But it was, they were, most of them were involved with drugs and acid and everything else. And then they, somebody presented Jesus to them and they're like, whoa, what's this? Uh, how many of you are aware of Calvary Chapel? Calvary Chapel, right? Chuck Smith was born in that movement. Chuck Smith, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa blew up with the hippie movement, okay? They were just presenting things to it. So uh, some good and bad came out of those movements, okay? A lot of people got saved, but a lot of people were still thinking, hey, it's all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So um, I'm going to mute Jim. (laughs) Anyway, uh, it was all about uh, all these these other issues, right? And so they had to think about those things. Um, How Lindsay comes out of that movement as well, but a lot of people were saved in that movement. And so... um, my seminary professor was at Berkeley during the time where it was all just about long hair and telling the people that like Jesus, all these different things. So anyway, look at number B. It says, what is ironic is that during the same period that saw an increasing interest in attractions of, to the person of Jesus, saw an increasing disenchantment with the institution of the church. It was up with Jesus and down with the church. Now, does that make sense? Up with Jesus, down with the church? I mean, we talked about this in equipping our uh, a couple of weeks ago, it's like, does that even make any sense? Up with Jesus, down with the church. What is the church, just in your common understanding? It's where God shows his affections, right? God puts his affections upon the church. It's his bride. And how is it that you can say you love Jesus, but you don't want to have anything to do with the church? It's an oxymoron, right? It doesn't, it's a contradiction in terms. But that's what they were seeing. The movement spawned hundreds of parachurch organizations devoted to proclaiming the gospel and teaching the Bible. I don't know how many of you guys are aware of a lot of parachurch things, but if you look down that paragraph there, Campus Crusade for Christ, Navigators, Youth for Christ, uh, Word of Life, and Billy, Graham, Billy Graham's Evangelistic Association and the National Association of Religious Broadcasters were some of the parachurch organizations. Now, the only problem with parachurch organizations is they take on what the church is supposed to be doing. The church was supposed to be doing these things, but the parachurch organizations come along and they start doing what the church is supposed to do. And it kind of robs and it takes away from the church's blessing to be out and doing things. The church is supposed to be planting churches, doing missions, and evangelizing, right? All the things that these parachurch organizations started doing, and this is all the way back in the 1930s, are what the church was called to do. So we need to kind of talk about that. Is that legitimate? Is that good for parachurch organizations to be doing the things that the church is responsible to do? Now, there's an idea that you can bring churches together and do a cooperative thing for missions and other things. But if there's an organization outside of the church that lacks structure and organization, is that actually hampering the church? Is one of the things we have to kind of talk about. Are parachurch organizations helping or hindering the church? So something you have to come to a conclusion about uh, through our studies. Is that the case? As we look at the formation of the church, as we look at the structure of the church, uh, the qualifications of the leadership of the church, are these things going on in parachurch organizations? Some of them, yes. Some of them, no. Turn to page, page 59. To some degree, this is understandable. Mainline denominations continue their departure from the biblical foundations of preaching the true gospel and far too many independent, fundamental, Bible-believing churches had substituted a man-centered legalism and other false standards of spirituality for the truth. However, new questions were raised. One pertained to the biblical emphasis itself. It was difficult to cite any clear, uncontested New Testament precedent for the contemporary equivalent of parachurch organizations. This raised the question of what right the parachurch had to take over ministry responsibilities the New Testament gave to the local church and the question of the relationship of the parachurch to the local church, especially as it pertains to the authority that it had. So there was a conflict. The parachurch basically started these things, and there were some conflicts with with regards to the church. What were the responsibilities of the church? Letter D, it says, More recently, in the 80s and the 90s, 
have brought both good news and bad news for the church. On a positive side, interest in the church is greater than it has been in many years, and a number of churches, especially those broadly termed evangelical, can report significant numerical growth. Now, it depends on what that numerical growth is based upon. Have you guys ever heard about the seeker-sensitive movement? Anybody here heard of the seeker-sensitive? When the seeker-sensitive movement was big when I was a little puppy, well, when I just got, I, I just got saved, right? The idea was is you needed to make sure that these people felt comfortable getting in the door. You had, you had a greeters out there. You made sure you started on time. There was coffee. There was, there was things out there that were attractive to people. Everything was based upon them. You even had toilets that flushed themselves and doors that opened. And I mean, there was just a plethora of things to make people feel accommodated, right? And that was the whole focus. I'm like, okay, that's, that's good as far as being hospitable, but the messages were not solid. The message was not about Christ. And you would sit there and you just go, what's missing? We're, we're entertaining all these people. We're welcoming all these people in, but I'm missing something. You, you'd hear the message and you'd kind of go, what's going on in the pulpit? What's coming out of the pulpit? And you just felt like you, you left as a believer and you're just like, something's missing here. So I was involved with some of those kinds of things. That was the, the move in, in when I just got first, got first got saved. That was the big move, seeker sensitive. How can we get people to come in and sit in the chairs and just sit there and we'll slowly teach them the gospel? Does that shock any of you? We're gonna have these people come in, we're gonna welcome them in and we're gonna slowly teach them the gospel just a little bit of time, just the Baptist doctrine a little bit of time. That should just kind of pet your fur the wrong way. The gospel should confront us. The gospel should be there and say, hey, you need to repent, right? But that was the, that was the mindset. I've heard that from more than one uh, current uh, leader in our area too. So it's scary. Look at letter E. Even among Christian leaders, there is a spectrum of attitudes among the local church. For example, in 1993, William Hendricks wrote a book entitled Exit Interviews, which interviewed a number of people who had left churches for various reasons, many of whom were reconnected were never reconnected, either with a church they left or with another church. The author described them as backdoor believers, many of whom, in his assessment, were developing vibrant spiritual lives. That's like, how are they doing that? Nurturing their relationships with God apart from the traditional means of the church and parachurch, and notes how many of his interviewees describe themselves as moving closer to God but further away from the church. How is that possible? However, this latter assessment, page 60, assessment is a scriptural impossibility. Granted, there are times when a believer finds it necessary to leave a particular local church. True, with a variety of reasons, for a variety of reasons. It is also true that in many of those instances, believers have been deeply hurt, sometimes to the point where they are reluctant to associate with another church. But this cannot continue indefinitely in Jonine terms. Let's look at 1 John. Turn with me to 1 John 4, verse 20. And 21, we read this. 1 John 4, 20 and 21, it says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And if this, and this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So that's an oxymoron, right? It says, in one one simply cannot love, move closer to God while moving farther away from his people. The implication of Hendrick's book seems to be that one can grow just as well without the local church. So what is the local church here for? The local church is to help us to grow one another. How many of you like it when somebody helps you carry your burdens? Anyone like that? Do you like it when you have someone to share with? You know, women like to have counsel. You know what women like to do? Sorry, oh, I got mostly women in here. They like to just talk. You ever notice that women, if they just talk, if they get it out, help, help when you out, Levi. There's only three men here, so we gotta listen to this, right? They just wanna have it out on the table, right? They just wanna get it out. But there needs to be somebody there. There needs to be a fellowship of other women that they can share with, right? That's the body of the believers, the body of believers. I just need to share this. So men, when you go home, your wife just needs to share with you. Just keep your mouth closed. Just let her talk. She just needs to get it out. She needs to get it on the table, right? And then you bear that burden with her, you know? A lot of times they counsel themselves. So there's a little bit of merit. He's getting prepped. You're doing good. We're okay. We're good. This will work out. <laughs> Prepping one, encouraging another. Wes is like, I got this. Uh oh, my wife is. <gasps> my wife is on there. Okay. <laughs> Considering the following, let's look at these three statements. Look on page 61. Let's look at what Augustine. I mentioned Augustine before. Augustine is one of those who established the ecclesiology of the Roman Catholic Church. 
okay? So when we look at Augustine, we understand that we don't agree with him on his ecclesiology. We don't agree with him on his foundations of the church, but he was right on on his salvation. He was right on on, uh, as soteriology. Soteriology is how we get saved. He knew by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So we can hold on to Augustine, and we can quote Augustine on the fact of salvation, but when he talks about the church, look at this statement here. Look at number one, it says, uh, he cannot have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. Now, there's a little grain of truth in there, right? The church, the church has this idea of nurturing. Paul even said that he was a, one like a nursing mother to the Thessalonians, okay? So there is that concept. There is that beautiful, compassionary model of fathers and mothers within the church, right? When I got saved, there was an older man who brought the gospel to me. He was like my spiritual father in the faith. And my wife had other people who came around her. They were like spiritual mothers to her. So in the body of believers, there were those relationships, spiritual relationships. But here he's saying is like the mother, right? Luther, Martin Luther, um, apart from the church, salvation is impossible. Is that true? Apart from, the, apart from the church, salvation is impossible. Is it only by the... Right, right. Yeah. You know, and Jesus' response to that was, today you will be in paradise with me. What role does Jesus play for the church? He took on our, he took on, he was yeah, but, what? son of God. He, yep. He was the son of God. Mm-hmm. But he's the, he's the head. But he, he's also, you know. Yeah. I, I, agree with, I, I agree partially with what you're saying, but think about Christ on the cross, too. He's the head of the church. So the church, the church is there, and this man recognizes that. So we won't talk about the, the, the calling there, but yeah, I understand what you're saying, right? So the, the church the in... Salvation, Jesus, absolutely. Says, so we're thinking about now what the definition... So you're already starting to think in your head, right? What's the definition of the church? That's next week. But what is the... What, how is the function? Let me, let me turn you guys to a, a, a tough passage. Turn with me to Philippians 1. Turn with me to Philippians 1, 15 through 18. Uh, this came up in equipping hour, and I didn't have it on the tip of my tongue when Larry brought this up. He says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. This is Philippians 1, verse 15 and 16. Uh, 17. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So the question is, are the guys that are proclaiming it believers? Is everybody mentioned here a believer? Is the church present in what he's complaining about? I would say yes, that those guys, even though they have a a wrong motive, they're still Christians because they're presenting Christ. Okay, they're presenting Christ, but their motives are for themselves. They're not pure motives. I still think they're believers. Now, I I make this in comparison to what you see in Galatians 1.8. In Galatians 1.8, Paul is rebuking them saying, you guys are anathema. He's saying you're devoted to hell because you have another gospel. Here he's just saying, hey, as long as Christ is being put forward, whether their motives are good or not, it's being put forward. So I would argue in this passage, this is kind of a difficult passage here, uh, Philippians 1, 15 through 18. It's kind of a difficult passage. But the idea here is it's a motive of the heart. It's not an issue of are they believers or not. So I'd say these guys are members of the church. What's, what's a church member? What's a church member? Someone who believes in Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? Again, we're getting back to what the church is, right? It's, it's not this building. It's us. We're the church, right? We're the temple of the living God, right? Corporately and individually. So we have to think about those things. So I would say yes, Denise. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Um, but, well, I kind of disagree with you on that. Um, because I think that That's good. You're wrong, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because, um, I don't know. When I was coming out of it, and I always bring it up, but when I was coming out of the charismatic movement, mm-hmm. I think that right. was the first
Right. No, he's a heretic. Printed, he, print, he printed books that prove it. Right, and that's where I would. Well, no, see, he's, because he's. Yeah, but he's a he's a heretic, and he's so so so. I know Bill Johnson. What he writ, what he's what he's written, is that he says that Jesus is not deity in flesh. Therefore, he is he is not a believer. There's no issue of motive there. That. That, that's a Galatians 1 8. So I'd say he's in Galatians 1 8, not in Philippians 1 15 and 18. But, but at the same time, because, okay, I'll, I'll give you a. Along, along with the sea of lies, there's some truth in it. Right. And there can be people within um, the Christian movement that are trying to say, well, Jesus is the Son of God. And there's some truth in it. Right. So I'll give you two examples. So, Bill Johnson, we know he doesn't have the gospel. He's, he, the material he's printed and put in publication proves he doesn't have the gospel. Now, I don't know how many of you guys feel bad about Rick Warren. Um, I don't That's okay. He's one of the guys that I followed in the 80s and 90s. Okay, he was the seeker sensitive guy, right? Still is. So, so I would say he's more like, he's on the lines and some of those people come out of the seeker sensitive thing are more like the Philippians 1, 15 through 18. What's their motivation? What's their motive behind it? but they still are probably saved. I know people who've gotten Susan Berger. She got saved reading the book, you know? Right. Um, you know, you got, whoa, really? So she comes out of Buddhism and she gets saved by reading Rick Warren's book? And uh, Anyway, so, you know, I would say Rick Warren's material, the secret sensitive stuff, is more on the Philippians 1, 15 through 18, whereas Bill Johnson is Galatians 1, 8. He's anathema. Does that make sense? So I want to draw a contrast. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the true church is those who have, have the gospel, there's no way that gospel can go forward because what Bill Johnson presents, even though Lindsay Davis got saved in that cult, she got pulled out of it. Think about that. She got pulled out. That's, that's ecclesia right there. Okay, That's being pulled out. The father revealed the son to her. She got regenerated. She started proclaiming that, and they expelled her. There you go. That's pretty clear. That's Galatians 1. Right. And you got pulled out of it. That's, and that's the church, okay? That's a, that's a beautiful picture of the church being pulled out of something. So, and that's what we hope for. That's what we hope for for people like that. Yes. We're in the question and answer time, by the way, because we're 40 minutes into it. <laughs> so you're good. You're okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. Sorry. So Philippians, Philippians 1. Sorry, I do talk too fast. So just raise your because this is the question and answer time. We got now we're into ten minute questions. So we we did forty minutes with the, anyway. So Philippians, it's a kind of a tough patch. It's Philippians, it's not it's not really clear, right? But I would say when you compare it to what he says to the Galatians in Galatians one eight, where he, he says you have another gospel, you've abandoned Christ. Later on, he says you've given up the one who loves you, right? So it's clear in Galatians one that he's upset with the fact that they have a different gospel, and he's calling them anathema, which is devoted to hell. He's, he's not bearing any bones. He says it twice, too, just so they'll get it, right? Those who are doing that. Yes? And also in 1 John chapter 5, when we're told to test the spirits, mm-hmm. to see whether it's of God, and, like, that's a command. Yes. So that you're literally, like, you know, it's like when I was in the Charles preaching, you know, there's some stuff that kind of raised my eyebrows about, but, you know, it's not blaming in your face false teaching. <laughs> not yet. Uh, it's four. It's First John, four. Uh, the beginning of it. Are you actually called to test the spirit? Yes, you are, and so that's what you do with with false teachers. And what is the what is the criteria of that? Let's look at that really quickly. It's a good little section to look at. Look at First John four because we look, we looked at the end of that chapter. Look at the beginning of that chapter. It says, "Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God." How do you test the spirits? He's going to tell you right now. This is the formula for testing true spirits and false spirits. Right here he says, um, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, right, God, man. And there you have the, the delineation between Bill Johnson and Rick Warren. Rick Warren knows that truth and proclaims that truth. Where Bill Johnson 
does not. Okay? So, flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. It's already been in the world, it's still in the world. And he talks about them being children there. So that's a good, that, that's what we're supposed to do, right? So we do that. Anyway, um, back on the notes on letter G. Uh, reading through some of that. Again, uh, if you look at First, first John 2.19, you should highlight that in that section right in the middle of that paragraph. Why did they leave? Because they were not of us. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Josh Harris is one. I don't know how many of you guys know Josh Harris. I actually took him out of the book list. He, his book was actually in our, our recommended books for you guys to read. It, we took it out. Why? Why do you think I did that? How many of you guys know Josh Harris? Uh, yeah, he, the guy that left. yeah he, he left the church. He basically said he doesn't believe what he's been preaching. Okay, a little history on Josh Harris. Uh, he lived here locally. He was a homeschool kid. He grew up, went into ministry, wrote three books, I think, at least three books, uh, on dating, very good, very moralistic, went over to Gathersburg, Maryland, took over a mega church there, was preaching, just people were coming and everything else. Come to find out, he says, I don't believe anything I've been preaching. Whoa, if you look at the story of Josh Harris, I mean, he was like the golden boy, right? Uh, Josh Harris. Josh Harris, he wrote, uh, uh, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, uh, I Don't Date the Church. There's a couple of different books. Very good moralistic books, but when you read through them now with a different lens, you go, he didn't have Christ in this. Wasn't there, you know? Kit. Right, that some, right, what we call that is called debt theology, okay? Uh, debt theology, for, for you guys who don't know, is, is like you feel that you have to pay God back. How many of you feel like you've got to pay God back for what he's done on the cross? You, gotta, you have to pay God back for what he's done on the cross. It's called debt theology. This is just a simple way of explaining it. Absolutely. You feel, you feel you have to do something to appease God. That's good. Yeah, and the, but the work the works are a result of your salvation, right? So again, I would address this from. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. You're saved by grace through faith, but not that of yourself is the work of God, so no one will boast. And you're a workmanship of, of God created in Christ Jesus to do the works which he prepared beforehand. The works in which you do have been, already been prepared for you to do in gratitude for what God has done, not in a debt idea. You're not paying God back. You're seeing those works as something I'm doing to say thank you to God, not trying to appease God, not trying to pay him for your salvation, right? You're doing those because of who he created you to be, Okay. So he created those works that we work, we walk in. So there's the righteous works you do, correct? Do you do good things? Yeah. Right. But do you do, do you screw up every once in a while? Do you screw up trying to do good things? Do you screw up trying to do good things? 
Do you ever screw up? Yeah, okay. Uh, you know? okay, anybody else screw up any once in a while, right? Okay, yeah. that's the whole point, right? We do screw up, but these things are covered by the blood of Christ. And again, we're, we're doing those things that he's called us to do, right? And we're not trying to pay him back. We're just trying to say thank you, right? Our life is a, is a thank you to God. That's all I have to think. Thank you, God. I'm going to... But, yeah, but he, he's like, hey, I got you covered, right? So anyway, but the, the works are there for us that he's prepared beforehand. We have to just, just remember that. We're not coming up with the works. He's prepared the works for us, right? He is sovereign over those things. He's given you a certain desire uh, to do certain things in ministry. You just desire to do certain things. He's put that desire on your heart and you delight in him in that. Yes? He ends him that way too. Yeah, he so he's right. given it to you. And also, I suggest reading Romans chapter 7, the whole chapter, and then also read um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Because God's not punishing us, you know, for, oh, have you looked today? I'm not punishing you. No, he's a father. He's a really good father. And what a father does is he corrects us, you know, he's not yep. And where do you tell the devil? Where do you tell the devil that you're no longer condemned? There's no, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Yeah. Paul tells us, God tells us that very clearly. There's no condemnation. You know, where do you find that? Romans, where? Eight, eight one or six. It's, yeah, it's, it's Anyway, so we're Romans 8. Therefore, so when, when you think these things, when you think these thoughts of, of these things, you say, there, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. But it's a therefore, so you need to read Romans, like you said, you need to read Romans 7. Let me finish real quick and we'll take a quick break. Look at page 62. Letter H says, all of these quotes from Hendricks, Augustine, Luther, and Calvin. We didn't read Calvin's quote because it's lengthy, but I want you to go back. I want you to read. Uh, we, we did read Augustine and Luther. Read Calvin's quote. He talks about the idea of the church being a mother as well, and he makes some good points. But he says, come from men who gave clear evidence of saving relationships with Christ. So that's the biggest thing we need to understand. These men knew the gospel. These are believers in Christ. So their perspective might be not complete in what they understood and how they looked at the church, but they do give us emphasis that they are saved. These are saved men. They are or were not heretics, but the potential for misunderstanding and abuse here makes it all the more important for the believers and especially pastors to return to a biblical view of what the church is and to have the same regard for its importance as the triune God does. Okay, That's why we're studying these things, okay? Because men throughout the ages have had different v- viewpoints, all right? Some of those things we can take. That's why I always like to, to put Augustine out there and say there are certain things that we can take from him, certain things we can't, okay? Then there's others who we can't take anything from, and some of those I just mentioned, right? Uh, Bill Johnson, you can't take a thing from him. He's not a believer. Yeah, Bill Do not take anything he says, okay? Uh, run and flee from that particular ministry. Um, Rick Warren... I don't recommend him, but he's got some points, okay? People have gotten saved. They do a, a great, tremendous missions work and everything else. But their methodology, I don't agree with. That's all I would say on that. So, pure and simple. Um, also, I don't agree with him on some doctrines, but we're not going to get into that. So, I want to take a quick break. You guys have to the top of the hour, and then we're going to go into First Timothy. So, open up your Bibles to First Timothy 3.15. Okay, okay. We're getting started again. First Timothy 3.15. Um... Let's take a look at 1 Timothy 3.15, and I would like to start in verse 14. Uh, so, Carol, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, um, did you get my message so you could let everybody know? Negative, I did not. Where was that message? It's on your phone. Oh. It has all the three dates. 
Okay. Hi, honey. Oh, wait, that's for me, not for you guys. <laughs> I shouldn't read out loud. There will be class the 25th, the 9th, and the 20th. Okay. So, okay. Just a date. All right. So if you guys want to open up uh, your schedule real quick, I just got, the Navy just gave me some information. Um, so we will have class on the 25th, second class on the 25th. So if you look on page uh, six of your of the, out, the handout, so open up to page six. I want to give you some dates on there. Apparently the Navy just cleared us for not going for a period of time. So I guess that's a good thing. Anyway, so class number two, we will meet on the 25th, which is next Tuesday. And on September 1st, is that right? August, September. And then the 8th. So, so for two, for the second meeting will be 825. The third meeting will be 91. The fourth meeting will be 98. Does that make sense? So we will be meeting those. And then we're in limbo after that. So, and I will let you, I will let you know as we go. So there'll be there'll be two weeks it will take off in the middle some point in time. We're hopeful after that. <laughs> we're hopeful. We were just talking about that. Yeah, Kim and I were just talking about hopefulness. So, oh, anyway, so let's read the section. Open up to First Timothy three fifteen. Let's start in fourteen. It says, "I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself." So he's talking about the Christian life. He's talking about how we conduct ourselves in the church. The church conducts itself in a certain way. Would you guys agree with that? Conducts ourself in a certain way. In the household, so now we want to examine in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So he says four things there. There's four descriptions there of what the church is. So this is vital for us to understand ecclesiology is what Paul is saying to Timothy, okay? He's giving Timothy instructions. Timothy's going to be the pastor at Ephesus, at the Ephesian church where Paul spent a good couple of years of his time encouraging those there. So we want to look at what he talks about here and the terms that he uses for this household. So under letter A on page 67, or 62, we read this. This is the church of the household of God. The Greek term there for household is oikios, and it is used in the New Testament both to refer to a dwelling place or an immediate family or household. Either of these ideas could be appropriate applied to the church. But let's take a look at what he says farther up. Look back up in verse 4. He says he must be one who manages his own household well. He's talking about overseers. He's talking about those who are the elders of the church, right? But look what he says. This is in the context of the word okios, and we want to understand it. So he says he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Okay, we're doing that, right? And if you scan on down, uh, where's the next one? He says in verse 7, and he must have a good reputation with those outside of the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Oh, there's another household there. Where, where did I miss it? Oh, sorry. But if one man does not know how to manage his own house, verse five, but if a man does not know how to, how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So there he's making the household and the church synonymous. See that? He's saying the man's household, what he governs is his own household. The family household, the immediate family household, is just like the church of God. So if he can't manage his own household, he can't manage the household of God. So this is the context of what we're seeing here, where we understand what he's meaning here when he says the household. And not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation, incurring uh, that in condemnation incurred by the devil, verse seven, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, that's vital, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women likewise must be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. So all the whole context so far is all about the household arrangements in the household that he's referring to here. 
Verse 13, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to talk about the household of God. So the context here is the household that these men govern, the household where they have a wife and their children. So the idea here when we look at uh, the issue of the household of God, he's talking about a place of an immediate family. So we're in a family together. How many of you guys like being in a family together? You guys like being family? Do, does anybody annoy anybody here? Does, you have, does, anybody, does anybody, is it just me? That, I have a, two older brothers and a sister, right? Does, do, do they, do, growing up, I was annoyed all the time or, or something like that, right? So there's those, there's those moments of tension, but there's also those moments at Christmas time when they buy me presents and I'm happy, right? So those are good times. But so you know there's moments of stress, but there's also moments of great joy. You know, family, our family are a joy to us. There's some stress, there's some tension, But all in all, uh, no, we're not all going to get along. That's one of the ideas, right? Yeah. So the church as God's dwelling place. God lives in and among his people, both individually and corporately. We're called the temple of God. And the term that Paul uses throughout the New Testament after the book of Acts is the the term naos, N-A-O-S is the transliteration. That word is the word that's used for the holy of holies. Okay, there's two words that we can use for the temple of God. The herion, H-E-I-R-O-N, I think it's in your notes there, H-I-E-R-O-N, at the bottom of that paragraph there on page 62, it was the idea of the entire corporate temple grounds, okay? But the word naos, N-A-O-S, is a word for the holy of holies. That's what he refers to us as. When Paul and the other apostles in the New Testament and John in the book of Revelation refer to us as a temple, they're referring to the holy of holies, You guys know what the Holy of Holies was, right? That's where the place only the priest could go once a year because that's where the presence of God resided. That's what he calls us as the temple, okay? When he refers to us as the temple, that's the the crux of what Paul is telling the people in the household of God, the family of God. That's who we are. Think about that for a minute, right? We're the household of God. We're the, the place where the intimacy of God comes and resides with his people. He will be in his people and he'll be amongst them. Think about that for a minute. That's like a, that should just blow your minds, right? We should end there and go, well, that's the church, right? We got more to deal with. But that's the word that Paul is using here as he talks about temple. But let's turn to that, 1 Corinthians. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Let's start in verse six or chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6. Let's take a quick look at this as he refers to them as temple. Uh, 6, 19 through 20, we read this. I'm in the right spot. Oh, I turned to 2 Corinthians. Sorry about that. No, 1 Corinthians. I was in the wrong spot. My, my bad. I was doing bad things. So I want to go to 1 Corinthians 6. It'll even look bad. 19 through 20. It says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple or even a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your what? In your body. How many of you, everybody eating good today? Everybody exercise today? You're glorifying your God and your body, right? I eat everything with scan bars on it, so I have to be really careful. I have to go exercise more often than not because I'm, I'm kind of bad that way. But we glorify God in our bodies, right? We're supposed to take care of our bodies, right? We're a temple of God, therefore we care for our, our bodies in that regard. So that individually we do that, but corporately also. Turn back to chapter 3. In chapter 3, 16 and 17, we read this. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? God's Spirit dwells in you. If any man destroys the temple of God... God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. The idea of that destroy there is an idea of defilement. So if we defile our bodies, if any man defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, okay? So we need to understand that. Also, it's a sanctuary. The idea of a sanctuary is a place of refuge, a place of peace, where it says temple. Yes? Okay, so, so anybody that the temple It depends on, Yes. Sexual immorality. A lot of people take this verse to say you don't commit suicide. If someone commits suicide, they are not a believer. Now, I've, I've seen some people who have been under stress who are believers who know the gospel and have committed suicide. I don't say, okay, I'm trying to thwart that whole idea, but this scripture doesn't speak explicitly to that. It's the idea of a defilement or a sexual immorality or things like that. You have to be very careful about those things. Okay? So it's, it's a warning passage in some regards, right? It's not clear cut. It's not like God's going to come down and whack, you know, if you sin. Don't, don't. No, you're not. 
Yeah. No. So I, I wrote a paper on that. I'll give it to you. From Old, Te- Old Testament to New Testament about tattoos is not a defilement. I can give you a paper. I wrote a paper on, on, on tattoos. Yeah, there's, there, there's good stuff there. Anyway, so looking at this, looking at this first glance, you see, do not, you do not know that you are a temple of God. The you there, and I said this in equipping hour, the you there is you all. It's a second person plural. So it's an idea of the corporate body, okay? We also need to understand that the church is a body, okay? So, the, so in the South, they say you all, right? When they mean a second person plural, that's what this is in this context here. It's corporate. So now he's talking about corporate. Earlier, when I looked at the chapter six, he's talking about us individually. Now he's also saying corporately, you're a body. You're the temple of God, okay? So when we think about the church, we also understand that we're a body of believers and corporately we're a temple too, but individually you're temples. So you individually, you, you think of yourselves that way, but also corporately, okay? He's mentioned both. He, he starts with the corporate in, in chapter three, but he talks about the individual in chapter six. So I just wanted you to understand that, that both are true. Corporately, we're to the temple, and individually, we're, temp- we're to the temple of, of God. Let's turn to page 63. It says, a new era had begun. Both Stephen, if you look at this section in, in, in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 48, I just want to talk about that. You don't need to turn there. He talks about that temple being no more and the emphasis of the temple of, of the church, okay? So he's just mentioning that at the end of his dissertation, and then he says, you guys are the ones who took out Christ, and they stoned him to death, right? He gets to that point where he's saying that temple is no more of, of importance anymore. So Stephen has come through the whole Old, Test- Old Testament. He's come to the point of the temple, and he's now said, the temple you don't need anymore. If you look at that section there, and it's just like, no, because there's a church coming, there's a fulfillment. That temple is no, more, no, no longer needed. What is their response? Because he says, you're the guys that kill Christ. They grit their teeth and they stone him to death, okay? Because he's basically saying that temple is no more in regard. The nos, and he uses the word nos, the nos is now the others. So, and Paul will say the same thing in Acts 17, 24, and when he's on Mars Hill as well. So that's the emphasis of what you see there in that, in that, in that category is there. So in Acts, I'll leave those for you guys because I want to move past some of that stuff. And if you look down, look down a little bit farther there in the middle of that paragraph where it talks about 1 Corinthians 9.13. It says, there are no references to Herion after the book of Acts. And I mentioned that earlier. So if you look down halfway in the middle of that paragraph, underline that right there where it's 1 Corinthians 9.13. There is no more reference to Herion in the book, after the book of Acts. No longer. It's all going to be Naos. So in the, in the New Testament, after the book of Acts is finished, there's not going to be any more references to that whole corporate temple ground, but only to the church in regards to the fact that it's the holy of holies, where God's presence dwells. So that's the emphasis that we need to see, that that's no more. And in letter B, it says, to reinstate the obvious but often overlooked point, when we speak of the church as God's house, we are not referring to a building, as those deacons would say, don't run in the household of God. We're referring to the people of God. That should be very poignant to us right now. Let her see. The point of application is simple. If we want to be where God is, we need to be where his people are. Do you think of that when you come to church? Do you think of that when you're with other believers? Do you think about that's where God is with the people of God? Thus, the emphasis in the New Testament uh, on the importance of the corporate fellowship When we come together, when we meet together, that's the idea. I'd like to make one more note. Look at that bottom footnote there on number nine, where it says 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Are you guys there with me at the bottom of the page? That's also NOS. So those of you who are in the eschatology class, this would be a place where you can make a little reference note there. refers to the man of lawlessness taking his seat in the temple of God, since this is in connection with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him in verse 1. And the eschatological term, the day of the Lord, it is in this author's view and mine, I agree with Dr. Mike on this, a reference to eschatological temple that will be rebuilt in the future. And there will be a place of holy of holies. There will be a nos in that. Uh, we wait. Hold on a second. Goodness, now I gotta re- rewind my brain. Um, no, that's after the rapture. We get rapture. Well, it depends on what your. It depends on what your. Uh, are you uh, pre, post, mid trib, post trib, middle trib, back trib, double trib, triple trib? 
I'm not going back into eschatology right now. I, I figured somebody's going to ask me a question like that. What I want, the point I want to make there is this, that there's going to be a temple. If, if this, re- reading this just from what it says, he's talking about a nos in that temple. So the temple is going to be rebuilt. If you look at uh, Ezekiel, the end of the Ezekiel's chapter, uh, uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel, you see a temple being rebuilt, but there will be that holy of holies place, right? Which is what we are now referred to. So we should be out of here, hopefully. Depends on your eschatology. Page 64. The church as a family. This is the more likely of, of, of Okos in, in 1 Timothy 3.15 since Paul uses the term in this way in immediate context. And I read you those verses in 4, 5, and 12. The immediate context is that this is the idea of a family. This concept is also compatible with much of the other language used in the New Testament to describe the believer's salvation. He is born again. In John 3.3, 3, when he's talking to him, he says, you must be born again. The actual term there is born from above. Did you hear what I said? It's not just born again. It's born from above. In John 3, 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. It says, you must be born of a, from above. So there's a whole idea that God has to instrument, instrumentally work and do that. Okay? So that's what the believer is, that one who's born again. People are born into families. Okay? So the, that family context is right there in Jesus' teaching to Nicodemus. How many of you are in charge of your being born? Anybody here? Were you char- when you got born, were you in charge of that? Did you initiate that? Did you have something to do with that? Or were you just born? You know, Who was in charge of that whole idea? Nicodemus wasn't getting it. And the point I'm trying to bring up is Nicodemus wasn't getting it. He was thinking of the physical concept. He wasn't thinking of the spiritual concept. He wasn't understanding from above in what God was doing through the power of his spirit to have him born from above, born again, okay? And so that's the concept there, but in the literal, the literal context there. And also, I would underline John 1, 12. If people like to throw that at you, make sure you read the rest of the verse. Turn with me real quick to John 1. How many of you have gotten in those discussions? Those are fun little discussions. Turn to John chapter 1, really quickly, verse 12. Many of a, of a person has said John 12... Or John 1 12 says this, but as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And they like to stop there. There's a comma there. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God caused us to be born and to be born again. It's not our will, right? It says, not of our will of man, but of God. God does these things. So the idea of us being in the family of God is a working of God. The point is simple. Letter B under on page 64 says the point here is simple. Not only do we need to be vitally connected to the church if we want to be where God is, we also need to be in his family if we are to consider God as our father. Remember Jesus said, our father. We pray that way. This is what a Christian who does not want to be a part of a church is an oxymoron. If you don't want to be a part of the church, how is it that you're a part of God's family? How can God, how can we call God their father, or how can they call God their father, typo there, while refusing to have anything to do with the other members of his family. If we do not want to have anything to do with the other people in our family, how is it that we can call God our father? It's impossible. It's an oxymoron. Look at the letter B then. He's also, also the church of the living God. So he calls this church of the living God, the living God's church. So this is the implication to what? What did we just study on Sunday? How many of you guys remember Sunday sermon? Anybody? What happened on Sunday? Well, it's those who were here. What did we celebrate on Sunday? What was the, what was the emphasis? What, was, what happened? Resurrection. Resurrection, right? The church of the living God. If Christ passes through death into life, we pass through death into life. You know, the, the Psalm 23, go through the valley of the shadow of death into life, right? We go through death and we see life on the other side because Christ does that. He says, you're the church of the living God. Okay, not the dead God. You're the church of the living God. So we need to remember that. Paul's second description notes that the church proceeds from God and belongs to God, who is the only true God and the living God at that. This latter expression both contrasts the true God with the temples of the dead pagan gods that are worshipped and also underscores God's personal and active involvement in the affairs of his church. Indeed, each member of the Trinity is pictured in the New Testament as treasuring the church above all other institutions. 
And let's look at this. Let's understand the, the, the Trinity in effect here. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter one. By the way, one of the things I want you to do in your reading is just to read through the book of Ephesians each week. How many of you can do that? I know there's a lot of other stuff to do. Can you read through the book of Ephesians? Can you do that? It's six chapters. How many of you can read a chapter a day? Okay, Here we, go. we do that? Okay, so just read through the book of Ephesians. That's the book that we're gonna be prominently in as far as our studies go with regards to that. But let's start in Ephesians chapter one, three, and let's read to 14. And I'll make a few comments as I go through this. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And again, that's the way we're referred to so much of the time in the New Testament as those who are in Christ. Just as he chose us in him, as the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us, the Father predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth in him also. We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory in him. You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit, sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. How many things we see in there? Let's look at this back on the notes. What has the Father done in that section? We just read in Ephesians. The Father has elected us. In love, God chose the church in him before the world began. How many of you are okay with that? Are you guys okay with the fact that you were chosen in Christ before the world even began? Is that okay? You okay with that? So what are you going to do about that? What are you going to, what are, you, are you going to proclaim that? Or are you going to kind of hold, well, you know, this is controversial. You know, or are you going to, or are you going to say thank you to God for that? Right? What if somebody says, well, I wasn't, I wasn't. How do you know you weren't? Do you know who Christ is? You present the gospel to somebody, right? You just say, hey, here's the gospel. Here's the death, burial, and resurrection. Do you come to him by faith? So present the gospel to someone who says, I don't know that to be true. The, I am talking about predestination. I'm talking about election. Look at the notes. The election of the Father. Who elected us? The Father did that. Okay, As you look through that, I tried to mention a little bit of it, but we'll, we'll work through that right now. The Father paid the ultimate price for the church by sending his one and only Son as a propitiatory sacrifice. That was the satisfaction of his wrath, the, the working out of that. John three sixteen, and again, 1 John 4, 10 and 14. And the resultant church functions to bring God glory. If you look at, turn with me to, over to 321, where he says that. To him be the glory in the church. What's the function of the church? to glorify Christ. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Those are synonymous things. The glory that Christ gets, he gets in his church. So we gotta be thinking about that. What brings glory to God? Because in the church he receives glory and he receives glory. Christ receives glory and in the church he receives glory. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. For every age to age, if you wanna take the literal on that. So he receives the glory because of what God's done. So we attest to the fact that we are elected by God before the foundations of the world. So it brings glory to Christ within the church. So this is not about us. This is about the glory of Christ. Loved by the Son, the atonement. Paul explicitly says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In Ephesians 5.25. Turn with me. Turn over to Ephesians 5. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, how many, how many men in the room can do that? Well, there's only one married man in the room. Levi, you got to work on this, sorry. <laughs> love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, right? 
That's the picture. The covenant of marriage is to picture Christ's love for the church. I think that's why Paul was able to, to do his ministry. Think about Paul. How many times was he beaten? How many times was he thrown? Well, one time he was thrown out as dead, but he was beaten three times with rod. Or, I can't remember exactly. I mean, this man loved the church even after he got beat by everybody in town, right? Everywhere he went, he got in trouble. But he loved the church because he saw the love that Christ had for the church. Now, think about it. Do we see the same thing? Do we see the love of Christ poured out upon the church and therefore we love each other because we see the love of Christ poured out on the church? I look at you much differently when I see Christ's love poured on you. I see you're the object of Christ's affections and all I want to do is say, wow, I want to serve these people because Christ has poured his affections upon them. Right? Do we look at each other that way as those who receive the affections of the love of Christ? So Paul explicitly says that, that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He laid down his very life for his sheep. He is therefore the head of the church. We see that in Ephesians 5, 23. If you just look back up, it says that he's the head. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. So on the cross, the head of the church is there, those who believe in Christ. So without Christ being there in some way, shape, or form, how is that gospel truly going out? Yes. You take the same verse that he's trying to pervert. The man's breaking and perverting. My sister-in-law's husband was a pastor. Yeah. My husband's husband was a pastor. Yeah. And he's been married for 30 years. No, crime's been committed. Either, either you're going to call the police or I'm going to call the police. When somebody comes to me, if that were the counseling case, I would say... That's that's a that's a that's a neglecting church. That's a that's a neglect of leadership. They're 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 culpable now. Um, churches have gotten themselves into trouble where they try to govern those things within their church that way, and it's it's, it's horrible. And so again, when somebody knows about it, a crime has been committed. If someone were to come to me and say that, I said either you're going to call the police or I'm going to call the police. They said, "Well, I've come to you for counseling. Isn't this private?" I said, "Not when a crime has been committed." I said, "You can either call the police or I'm going to call the police." So where my husband handled it is he went to the pastor first, right? No, there is consequences. You're gonna, you're gonna go, you're gonna go to, go to jail. So, but that's a, that's a perfect example of of of, of abusing. Uh, that's abuse of scripture. No, so that's where the that's where the rub comes in, right? In counseling, it's like, well, he's not treating me like Christ treated the church, and well, she's not submitting to me. That's not the way the text reads. You're to be a picture of Christ in the church. So the husband is supposed to be a picture of Christ to her, whether she submits or not. And she's to submit to him whether Christ is or not. But if there's any abuse, that's a violation of the law. That's a violation of the text. There's a crime been committed. I'm sorry, you're outside the parameters of the... Uh, uh, yeah. There is... There's, and... And abuse. No, I, I, I make the case about that from what Paul teaches in, in 1 Corinthians. There's abandonment, there's abuse, and then there's sexual... Those are all valid reasons to leave. You're not supposed to put yourself under, under, under somebody doing that at all. I've heard pastors preach that the only reason is that you're No. No. In the, in, the, in the very same text, it talks about abandonment, and therefore the abandonment, and there's also the issue of, of abuse. So... There's no reason why that, that, I would say, you come out of that relationship right now today uh, and we call the police and they, they need to be informed. 
there's no, there's no qualms. I can go right through the First Corinthians 7 and show you right there uh, that abandonment is, is illegitimate uh, or abuse. Abuse, abandonment, or infidelity are all three legitimate reasons for to walk out of that relationship. And those are, those are biblical, so she's not violating that. No, I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, people don't want to deal with that. That's, you need to deal with that. Uh, any, any crime that's been committed, so uh, it needs to be taken to the law enforcement. True, pure, and simple. There, there's no, count, you know, I don't counsel people and say, oh, we'll just, let's just talk about this. Crime's been committed. No, we'll talk about it after the fact. Body of Christ, page 65. So the body of Christ, Jesus is presently building his church, Matthew 16, 18. That's the first place that we actually see uh, uh, in Scripture the idea of the church being mentioned. Jesus says, I will build it on upon Peter's confession. Peter confesses that Jesus is, is the Son of God, and he says, upon this rock, upon that confession, I will build my church. And it was promised personally, you need to add a B there, there's a, there's a typo there, and has promised to be, to personally be present with the church when it carries out its discipline. And that would have been a case of church discipline as well as law enforcement and evangelism. Christ says he'll be there with us when we do these things. When we practice discipline in the church to restore people, when we go out evangelizing, he will be with us to do those things. He's in his people and he's with them in all regards to those things he asks us to do. The church regularly observes the Lord's table in remembrance of his death and anticipation of his return. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, at the end of that he says, with the hope of his return. We celebrate his death and when he's going to return. That's what Paul is teaching the Corinthians there, that we celebrate not only his death, burial, and resurrection, but the hope of his return for us. We're anticipating that. And he says that we're zealously doing that. So we have to think about that. The church is the zealous waiters. Are you guys zealous waiters? Wait, not, not table waiters, waiting zealously, right? There's a zealousness to your waiting, right? There's an anticipation. There's a, there's a great hope in that. So the church is those people who are zealously waiting, right? Who are anticipating, who are, who are can I use the word giddy? How many of you guys like the word giddy? Girls, do you like the word giddy? No, I'm giddy. I'm giddy. I'm just giddy. You haven't heard that one for a while, have you? Okay, so giddy is an okay word, right? It's like, we're giddy, right? We're excited, right? We're excited, right? There should be that excitement. Uh, that's the idea. There should be an excitement there, the zealousness, anticipation. And every time we celebrate the Lord's table, there should be that, that giddiness. Wow, I can't wait till he gets back. This is great. This is... Sorry, I don't do that normally when I serve communion, but I'm just saying there's a joy in it, right? We're celebrating the, the seriousness of our sin being paid for. But at the end of that, look at that 26. He says, with the hope of his return. Let's turn there real quick. Turn Turn, turn to that and read that last, let's read that last verse. 1 Corinthians 11. You guys can get giddy if you want. It says, for, in verse 26, it says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, as often as you take the Lord's communion, right, as long as we do you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The hope of his return, right? The hope of his return. We're zealously waiting, we're giddily waiting for that. And then let's look at that. So that's the, that's the son's work. The love of the spirit. The loved, loved by the spirit with regeneration. It was the baptism of the spirit on the day of Pentecost that brought the church into existence through signs and wonders. Each believer is brought into the church through the regeneration, uh, sanctification, and glorification. He promotes the unity of the church in that. And the unity of the, of the spirit unifies us and equips the church with the necessary gifts to function. That's the gifts we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. So think about this too. The body illustration is there before us. The gifting of the body. How many of you have just had a pair of feet and you get someplace but have no hands to do anything? If we get someplace as a body and we only have feet to get there and we don't have any hands, can we do anything? He says, there's some of you here that are hands. There's some of you here that are feet. Some of your eyeballs, some of your mouths. We have to function as the body, okay? The church has to function. Now, what if the hands don't want to do anything? What are we, how are we going to do this? We're kind of going to show up someplace and not be able to do anything, right? The body illustration is poignant. The New Testament is the only place. The Old Testament, the, the illustrations of the assembled people are there. In the New Testament, Paul adds the body, because we understand that. Christ is the head and we're the body. But if there's parts of the body that are not functioning and doing what they're gifted to do, it's like we showed up and we can't do anything. Or we don't show up at all because it's all hands and no feet. Or it's all eyeballs. We can, we can see where we need to go, but we can't get there. Right? So everybody needs to use their parts. 
So understanding the whole body illustration. But it's the regeneration work of the Holy Spirit that is there. The baptism of the Spirit. We're dwelt by the Spirit, empowering us to do things. How many of you are calling upon the Spirit today when you got up? Did you guys, anybody read their Bible this morning? Okay, did you ask God to attend to that with the Spirit? You can, you can read your Bible, can't you? How many of you read your Bible and go out the door and can't remember what you read? How many of you have read your Bible in the morning, gone out the door and forgot what you read? Unless you look at your little, unless you look at your little check sheet, you don't remember, right? So asking the Spirit who's in you, regenerated you, caused you to be born again, needs to be there to cause that to, again to be alive. So you're asking for God to do that again, right, in a fresh, fresh way to keep you mindful of the things, to lead you into the truth. It's part of the Holy Spirit's job, right? Right. Right. Very good. So still, and, and ask the Spirit to do that while you're sleeping. And yeah. I sleep better that way too. Yep. So let's look at the, the two more things we need to look at before we're done. The pillar of the truth. Paul's next description. Look at letter C on page 65. The pillar of the truth, right? There's this idea of holding things up. Uh, Paul's next description is even more significant. The term pillar indicates that the church actually holds up the truth. This is the function, right? A function of the church. We hold up the truth. The church is God's means of making the truth stand. He gives the example of Samson there. Also, it's poignant. If you circle that illustration uh, on the footnote there, it says there's actually a church growth leader who said that the people, if they're the pillars, they get in the way. Where it says holds up the truth, it says they hold up the truth, as in they get in way of the truth. Again, a perversion of the text, right? No, we're supposed to hold the truth up. We're supposed to pronounce the truth. He's saying, no, they get in the way of the truth moving forward. That's insane. So, but there's, again, this is a perversion of the text. So mis, uh, false teaching. Yes? Papal inerrancy? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that the Pope is, okay, so papal, papal inerrancy means that the, whatever the Pope says, ex cathedra, is the word of God. Yeah, anybody believe that here? Sure. Well, they wouldn't say it that way, but he, papal inerrancy, basically, yeah, whatever he says, ex cathedra, is the word of God. So, I'm not going to address that right now because they would not say that, but you're right. But papal inerrancy conveys that, but they wouldn't say that. But it is. So, in other words, look at, let's keep going. In other words, the truth uh, the truth would be destroyed without the church. Of course, this would never happen. Christ, Christ given Jesus' words about the perpetuity. How many know what perpetuity is? Raise your hand. Perpetuity. Nobody knows what perpetuity is. Sorry. It's a bond or security with no meriting date. There's no maturing date. When he talks about perpetuity of the church, he's talking about that there's no maturing date. The state of the church is a lasting forever. The church goes on forever. The church goes on forever. Okay? When he says that he, the gates of Hades not, will not prevail against it, what do gates do? Anybody, tell me what a gate does. What do gates do? Do gates go out in front of you? Do gates do stuff? Gates keep you from getting in, right? It says the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. The church is on the offensive. Uh, I heard a guy say one time that the church is on a holy jihad. Would you guys agree with that? The church is on a holy jihad against the gates of Hades. That's really the idea that he teaches to, to his disciples, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church, is the idea is that we're supposed to be attacking the gates. We're on the offensive, not on the defensive. We're not sitting here with the, with the gates going, oh, I hope that the, the devil doesn't find us. And it, no, we're attacking the gates of hell. That's what the church's job is. Just understand that for now. Um, however, our individual relationship to the truth and its impact in our lives is mortally threatened if the church does not play its proper role in our lives. Accordingly, it is highly unlikely that those who abandon the church as a means of spiritual growth or a means of grace are truly holding to the truth. 
1 John 2, 7, 2, 19. We talked about Josh Harris, the fact that they went out from us because they were not truly of us. Because they have torn away the pillar God has designed to uphold the truth. God has designed the church to uphold the truth of God in the following ways. Revelation. God chose to reveal the truth of the New Testament in and through the church. Turn with me to Ephesians 3. Should still be, no, we're in, uh, turn back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, 8 through 11. To me, the very least of all, least of all of the saints, this grace was given. Ephesians 3, 8. To preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. How is it going to be made known? Through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. We are part of the revelation of the truth of God. The church is to reveal these things to the heavenly places. In 11 it says, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. We are part of the revelation of God's word to the world. Also go on to verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works where? Within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Where? In the church and in Christ Jesus. We read that earlier. But there's a power available for us to do that. We need to ask God to send that power to us. We need to ask God to send his spirit to attend to what we're doing all the time. We're not capable of doing those things. So we need to ask God to send his spirit to do those things. Now, I'm not being weird and Pentecostal, right? Well, I like the Pentecostal guys. I'm just saying, we need to show our absolute dependence upon the spirit of God in us to do those things, right? We're dependent upon God to do those things, right? He's amongst us and he's in us, but to do the things, the works that we need to do, God, what do you want me to do today, you know? Just dependence upon God. Think about that. Obedience and dependence are the two ways we glorify God, showing that we're obedient to him. We're trying to be obedient. We mess up. You guys mess up? Yeah. But we're dependent upon him. So we show that dependence, that gives him glory. We show that we're trying to be obedient, that gives him glory. That's the idea. The church is that, that which glorifies God. And so he, he lines us out in that. In Ephesians 3, he talks about this thing. And by appointing in the church apostles and prophets, those who serve in the church, who serve at his foundation, Turn with me to that little section there, 2.20. So just go back in Ephesians 2. In verse 20 it says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He is that cornerstone. But the apostles and the prophets are the ones who are part of that. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple. That's a nos again right there. In the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God In the spirit. Again, there's the spirit again. The spirit is working in you and through you and around you, right? Where's Christ right now? Is Christ in you? The spirit of Christ is in us, right? But he's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, right? We'll see him again one day in his bodily form, right? It's an amazing thing to think that the deity and the humanity are still in heaven. God, man, is sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father. The only two where human human and the deity and the humanity are are conjoined together. And he'll return that way. Proclamation. Look at the bottom of the page. Proclamation. The church remains the instrument, uh, remains the instrument God has chosen to proclaim the truth of God to the world. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.2, you can add this one to the note on the side, 1 Corinthians 2.2, he desired to know nothing amongst them except Christ and him crucified. In Romans 10, 14 through 17, he talks about those who are sent out to proclaim the truth. How are they gonna know unless they have someone preach to them? And it's appointed in the churches in 2 Corinthians. It is in this sense that the church can be spoken of as the mother. Now we come back to that quote. Remember we talked about that quote? It's in this sense that the church can be a mother of believers. That there's that beautiful relationship of a nurturing relationship. Paul knew that very well, that he was nurturing the Thessalonians. That he was like a caring father and a nursing mother to the Thessalonians and what he was doing. Number three, we're on page 66. We're almost done. Administration. Only in the church can believers enjoy the structure and order that God has devised for their worship and growth. God has designed the church to be the sphere in which believers move from sin to holiness. Well, I can do that on my own, can't I? Can't I move from sin to holiness on my own? Do I really need you guys? How many of you guys can look at my life and say, you know what, you might want to work on this, buddy. 
You know, are you guys, anybody going to say that to me? Please do. Is it, are you going to look at my life and say, hey, buddy, you need to work on that? Have you ever thought about doing that? Or do I hold a position where you don't think I'm approachable? <laughs> Absolutely. But I should be approachable, right? I need people in my life. You need people. We need people in each other's lives to, to quietly come beside us and say, you know what? The way you wore your tie last Sunday really, no, I'm just kidding, but. There should be things. Right. Right. And I presented that. Remember I said sometimes I'm misquoting scripture from the pulpit and I don't realize it. I didn't get any emails. I haven't watched the video this week. Did, did I misquote scripture this week? I backed up into 1 Peter 3, 16. It was actually 15 and I caught myself. Oh, it's actually 15 to 16 when I said some things. Because it was just off the fly. But are you guys sending me emails? You have my email address. It's right there in the thing. Are you guys sending me an email? Say, hey, pastor, I'm a little confused about this. You said this, but did you mean this? That's legitimate, isn't it? You know, tell me, hey, this was encouraging, but you know, you have really messed up over here. I, don't, I have no idea what you're doing. Those are fine. Those are good things. That's administration, right? Protection. Let's look at number four. Protection. The church upholds the truth by protecting it from error, by disciplining and rejecting false teachers as well as immoral, disobedient, and unrepentant believers. The church also adjudicates in disputes between believers. We don't go outside of this. With regards to what uh, Shana mentioned, though, if a crime is committed, absolutely, we call law enforcement. But if there's a dispute within the confines of our church, we should have people who are wise enough to help mediate those things. That's where we should. We should be able to mediate in some regards. That's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 6. Why are you going out to outside sources? There should be wisdom within the church to help uh, help when there's disputes between the people in the church. When there's just a disagreement within the church, right? Now, if there's a house sale, sorry, I'm not going to help you. But if there's a crime, we call law enforcement. But if there's just a dispute between brothers and sisters in Christ, the church leaders should be able to uh, f- facilitate mediation in those regards. There should be a, a way to do that. So there should be protection, though. We should be calling out error. We see error in the churches around it. We see error coming, trying to come in the church. The church is supposed to do that. Support of the truth, the last one. The last expression conveys the idea of stability and per- permanence, uh, preeminence. Paul is saying that the church is the one institution God has promised to preserve through all time. Again, back to Matthew 18, 16, 18. This truth provides a tremendous source of encouragement to believers. The church is going to exist for eternity, especially when it is easy to look around us at various trends taking hold in the church, which gives us plenty of reason to be pessimistic. Think about it. Doctrinal heresy, secular methodologies, uh, impacting the church in anti anti-Christian biases in the wider culture. What do we see today happening? We see these things right now. It also provides a convincing argument for the idea that we as believers should direct our primary efforts toward the edification of the local church rather than organizations and institutions outside of it, such as parachurch organizations. See how we came full circle to the parachurch issues? Such as parachurch ministries, political involvement to stem the tide of moral relativism. How many of us are voting Republican this, this November? Do we, I mean, I'm just kidding. You don't need to vote. Rep- okay. Christian. Nope. Nope. Look at the last sentence there. Why involvement in these last two institutions has its place, it should not divert the church from its primary mission. So what's primary is the church's missions, right? So if parachurch organizations, other organizations are taking the place of what the church should be doing, the church should be stepping up and saying, hey, we should be the primary ones. These things can be secondary. But when the church loses its primary focus on the things that the church is supposed to be doing, then there's a problem. And if we're supporting those things and not supporting and helping with the church, again, we can find other like-minded churches to plant churches and to do the things of ministry around us there's a, there's a collaboration. If we're like minded and we have a, a, a con, we understand the gospel together, we can come together in a coalition, right? Like mindedness to do things. But if we're just saying, let the parachurch organization do that, kind of like that's wrong. Last, last year, last uh, Christmas, Clear Lake Baptist had a happy party for uh, Samaritan's Purse for Operation. Yep. Right. Now, so, so is, is, are they presenting the gospel? Yeah, they are, because those kids get preached the gospel before they get handed their 
Yeah, and there's there's usually a little there's a little track in there, right? Yep. So so they're doing something. So uh, I'll give another illustration. The Eureka Rescue Mission down on Second Street. Okay, we don't we pray for them right now. We used to financially support them, but a lot of people come knocking on the door wanting the handouts. So how do we use them? They're a parachurch organization, but they present the gospel. I don't agree with everything that they do down there as far as their their structure. But they're also serving in a ministry capacity that we're not capable of doing. Can we house, house and clothe and feed a whole bunch of people that are homeless on the streets here at this church? We could, couldn't we? Could we clothe and house people who are homeless here at this church? Hmm, it's big enough. Do we, have the, do, do we have the manpower to do it? Do we have the, the codes to do it? Nope, we don't. I'll tell you right now, we get in trouble if we tried. But we can support an organization that does do it. Um, we're, I'm trying, I'm trying to hope, hopefully we'll get around to doing that again. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's part of the, it's a part of the missions thing. We'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get back around to it. Um, but you know, I, you give privately to them too. People do, you know, but when people come knocking on the door, what do we do? We can't close, clothe them and house them and feed them. You know, we can give them certain things, but, uh, we used to get it taken advantage of that people just line up out there because we used to give out vouchers for food and for gas. Yeah, people, other people abused it, right? And it got ruined. But anyway, so as far as parachurch organizations goes, we, as we go through this material, all I want to say is, is that how do we rightly understand our collaboration with other organizations, other parachurch organizations? Is it something the church should be doing here at Boone and C Street? Should we be collaborating with other churches for strength? Um, or is it something a parachurch should do? What is the validity of that? That's one of the things we need to discuss. But we are also to remember, we are the support of the truth. We're to support the truth. And so the a- aspects of what we do. So this is the introduction to what we're going to be covering, okay? This is an introduction. It's kind of a little bit of an overview of some of the things. But, so with this, if you read that last note, with Paul's words underscoring the importance of the church, and the next becomes it necessary for us to properly define the church. We need to understand what the church truly is to define the church. So this becomes the focus of chapter two, the definition of the church. So again, a lot of the things we had a little bit of a, a little issues with is because we weren't properly defining the church. I left that. I didn't really want to dig into that because we're going to dig into that chapter two. But if we rightly understand what the definition of the church is biblically, then we'll understand more about how the church functions, right? But it has to be a biblical definition because some of the things that have been out there as far as the church goes as a def- definition are methodologies, they're marketing. Uh, there's a lot of things that have infected the church, okay? And that uh, once we start looking at the biblical context, we're going to recognize those things. And, hey, wait a minute. They're all about method. They're all about, the gospel is not there, right? They're just getting people in the seats and they're just, they're just giving them a donut and coffee. Sure, they got a big church because there's no gospel coming out from the pulpit. There's not a gospel ministry there. So, We'll evaluate those things as we go. So we're out of time. We're done. But we had questions as we were talking. So we'll try to stay on this. So for next week, for next week, read through the book of Ephesians. I want you to read through the book of Ephesians, a chapter a day, and just highlight things where it talks about church. Okay? It talks about functions of the church. It talks about the church and its definition. It talks about purposes. Think about those things as you're reading through the book of Ephesians. It's the book that we look to for our understanding of what the church is. Again, I mentioned this before. If you want to look at Christology, you look at the book of Corinthians. If you want to look at joy and how to, how to face trials, Philippians, right? Galatians is just like, it's all out there. It's all about righteousness. But Ephesians is, is that epistle that Paul writes with an emphasis on church. So read through Ephesians. Read this chapter on chapter two, the definition of a church. Don't get hung up because you need to get to the end of this chapter where it talks about the 10 trademarks of the church that's on target. You need to get to the end of this chapter. So go through it, you know, cut it into like four or five pieces uh, because it's about 30 some odd pages. Anyway, cut it into smaller pieces, but you need to get to the end because at the end of it, it talks about the trademarks of a church, okay? And also it has a little, a little, issue there at the end of it where it talks about man-centered and God-centered churches. So page 101, you want to focus on two. What is a man-centered church and a God-centered church? So we need to be a God-centered church, a Christ-centered church that makes that proclamation. Um, I'll stay for just about five minutes to answer questions, but let me pray as we, we end. Father, thank you for what you've given us. Lord, help us to rightly understand what it means to be the pillar and support of the truth, to be amongst the family of God. What does it mean for us, Father, as we are bought and paid for by Christ, that we function as that body, as we 
demonstrate that in everything that we do. So Father, please help us to rightly understand who we are in Christ and what the church is to be doing and how we're to be a part of the one another, Lord, as a body of Christ. So help us to see what our giftings are, how we're to be using them, and how we're to bring glory to Christ in all of this. So I thank you for your people's patience, Lord, and uh, Lord, ask your rest upon them tonight and your blessings. So please bless them for your glory, for your namesake, please. In Jesus' name we do ask. Amen.